Hi, I'm Dr. Mitch Tarlin, and welcome to the Truth Talks podcast. Today's episode is going to be just as fun as it gets. I am with Antoinette Perrin with a hard G. How are you? <laughs> How are you? Antoinette, the actress, the comedian, you have an incredible story uh, from Brooklyn uh, to where you're at now. Girl, take it away. We want to hear the story. You know, it's, I have to tell you, it's like when I think about the journey, um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I look back at the little girl, you know, who was born to an old world Italian family. I mean, I'm, I'm talking like my father went over the Brooklyn Bridge on a horse. Okay, so my father was already 56 on the day I was born. So really old world, old world tradition. And then I was born in New York City. So it was a very interesting uh, kind of juxtaposition and background to grow up in. And I was always surfing that as a little girl. It was, it was like I was trying to be the daughter and be the, um, you know, move the lineage forward. But then I was surrounded by kind of a progressive place to grow up. And it was really uh, like, a, like a beacon of progressiveness. And so I was always trying to figure out where I fit in in that. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was an awareness at an early age that, okay, this is going to be sort of challenging because <laughs> I have to be the daughter, but then I have to also survive. And I, you know, anyway, I grew up in Brooklyn, which you could see Manhattan in the distance. But people in Brooklyn never really ventured out to the city. So it was like very, it was a very kind of tough environment. And the city was there as a sophisticated place, but it was in the distance. And so, I don't know, it was, it was challenging, I have to say, to be this little girl who was very bright and happy, and then to have to survive a lot of the hardness. And I didn't grow up in a bad neighborhood by all means. I grew up in the neighborhood where Goodfellas was, you know, was depicted. So I grew up in a very kind of that neighborhood. That said, because it was that neighborhood, it was a very uh, protected neighborhood. I don't know. It was just a really like happy place. So you were, there was that. So you're watching this kind of hard criminal background, but then you're also growing up really safe and protected. Um, you had every nationality all around you, like the Brooklyn grew up next to Norwegian, next to the Jewish neighborhood, next to the African-American. And so you had to all get along, but it was also very segregated. So it was just a, it was just a fabric of diversity, which is how I grew up. There's no doubt that ended up playing a role in, in this whole amazing success story you have, right? I mean, you took a lot of those lessons and like- Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I think it had, I had a huge role informing me, you know? Um, I don't even know how I did it, to be honest with you. I think back and I go, I stepped away from tribe and I'm the first generation to do so. And, you know, that makes me feel really, really proud, but it was, it was a long haul. And when I look back to that girl, it's, it's, another, it's another person, you know? It took, it took a lot and then it took a lot to leave my family and then drive across country after I got a Broadway show. It was an off-Broadway show at the time. Then I thought, well, you know, I have to go out West. If I'm gonna be an actress, I have to do that. And so I just left them. And that was really hard to do because we were so, you know, it was like, you didn't do that as a girl. You know, you just didn't leave. I know that sounds so crazy, but that's how I grew up. Like you really just didn't leave the family unless you were married. And, and somehow I didn't, get that message exactly <laughs> but it was challenging for my for my family to watch me leave so i'm proud of myself because you know it was as soon as i got to la a lot of things started to happen for me had you ever been in la have you ever been to la or were you just when you decided you were going to make this move did you say okay i'm moving from new york to la i had been once i had been once uh with it with an old with a boyfriend and my sister, of course, because you can't go anywhere without the sister. <laughs> I, could, I could never have masterminded that trip without my sister with me. <laughs> so I had, gone, I had gone for a week and I was like, there was something about the West that, that really called me. As soon as I was traveling over the state, you know, when I was, we're getting, you know, how like, you know, like LA, it's like, they say you, they're getting ready to land and it takes two hours to land. I mean, it's like <laughs> the biggest state. It's like, we're still landing and it's like two hours later, but but I just, as soon as I got over LA and over, over 
I, basically over California, I just was like, I'm home. Like it just felt like home to me. And then, you know, I never left. I never well, left. And, and obviously this is where all this accomplishment comes from. I mean, you've been in movies, uh, TV shows. J just give our listeners uh, some of the background of what you've done. Um, okay, well, I came out here and pretty soon after being out here, I landed... I had, I had, somebody had known that I spoke fluent Italian. I don't know how he knew, but somehow he knew and remembered that I spoke fluent Italian. And he worked as a, an, an intern in actually a really good agent's office. So like a kind of a boutique agent's office. And they got the call from a director named Peter Weir. We all know the big director, Peter Weir. And apparently he was looking for, he decided at the last minute that he wanted to add a character in this movie. And the lead of the movie was Isabella Rossellini. So I, they wanted somebody who spoke Italian. And so he, um, they called the office and this guy, Steven, remembered that I spoke Italian, called me up and he's like, you speak Italian, right, Anson? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, you got it. He said, do you know who Peter Weir is? And I'm like, not really. He said, well, you have to go down. They're looking for somebody. I get down there and it's like this massive movie set on location at the Hilton Hotel in downtown LA. I'm like, oh my God, this is like, like, how do I, this is like amazing. They sit me down with Peter Weir. I'm sitting by the baby grand piano. And he just asked me a few questions because obviously he didn't write it. There was no script. It was like something he was thinking in his mind. And he asked me a few questions about what it was like to be an Italian woman. Easy for me to answer. You know, what is it like to, to grow up in an Italian family? And I guess I must have said all the right things. I remember it being like a conversation that was really deep and profound. And then I walked away, and I think I was telling you this on the pre-interview. I walked away and I thought, my life has changed. My life has changed. By the time I got home, the phone was ringing and it was wardrobe. Even before the agent called me, they said, you know, we need your sizes. Could you be down here? And I thought, not even realizing that I was going to be working with Jeff Bridges, Isabella Rossellini, John Turturro, Tom Hulse, and me. <laughs> and I had never me. been in front of a camera before. It was like that. It was like that. And I, and I ended up, you know, we got along, Isabella Rossellini and I got along so well that he developed us into sisters. I was supposed to be like a friend of the family. And the two of us were like, instantly fell in love with each other. And I worked a week. I didn't have my SAG card. I remember driving on the, um, on the golf cart with Jeff Bridges, you know, they bring everybody to the, to the set, you know, from, from your trailer. And he's sort of sitting next to me and you know, can tell he like liked me and liked my vibe or whatever. And he was just like, you could just tell he was trying to figure out like, who the hell are you? Like, who are you? Like, how did you like, he was like kind of like wanting to know like who the hell I was and where did I come from kind of thing. And you said, you, you said, I just uh, flew in from New York and uh, I speak uh, uh, fluent Italian. I, I didn't even say that because it wasn't like I had just flown in. It was like, I was working as a waitress. And at that time, it's like, I would have never, I was never considered the leading lady. So I was always like the funny best friend, like the Rhoda to the Mary Tyler Moore. You know what I mean? I was like, I want to be Mary Tyler Moore, you know? That's awesome. It's just awesome. You know, part of the Italian thing was is Italians seem to get real comfortable in groups real fast anyway. That's true. That's true. Stand up for me was an extension of just my, uh, my skill set, I think. You know, because I, I hadn't done stand up very many times and I fell into it. I knew that I would, I knew I had a story to tell Dr. Mitch. Like I knew there was a story. I went on stage at the improv and it was 350 people. There were cameras. And I remember when they said my name, I was just like, I literally was like, couldn't remember my name. Like it was <laughs> horrifying. Like it's everything you think and worse. Cause you, people are waiting for you to make them laugh. Like what is harder than that? Not only public speaking, but then you have to public speak and then make and be laugh. funny. Horrible. I get up there, I've got little, little index cards and I start. And I just started rolling with my story. And then at one point I forgot completely what I was saying. And I made some reference to the Brady Bunch about like, when Cindy went on that show 
and and she couldn't remember Baton Rouge as it was so stupid <laughs> but that's what came to my mind and the whole crowd was but like dying laughing and so I walked off that stage and I was just like wow and I remember calling my father right away and I was like dad I said I just did something that I know is going to change my life forever even if I never do it again and and that's the true story I knew that from that moment on, I think it's really important to always walk in the direction of your fear. Obviously, not off of a cliff. <laughs> That's what I got to thinking. I don't know. <laughs> and I, I want to make that really clear. But like when I, when people have like, when people say, well, that scares me, I always go, well, if it scares you, there's probably something in it for you. So that's yeah, the that's stand up story. That's one. That's one of the reasons I absolutely love uh, talking with comedians because I, I'm a I'm just such a big believer in finding humor in life, man. Almost every all your problems disappear. I wouldn't have survived. It was completely. I mean, it sounds like what I'm depicting for you was kind of like. I mean, I wasn't violenced. You know, I didn't grow up. You know, in a domestic. You know, I didn't grow up the the way with the adversity that some people have. But for me, being a very gentle soul and a very happy little girl I had to really I had to find humor in order to navigate through situations and my family was very um heavy and dark not dark but heavy I and mean, the life was heavy you know it was like people were not joyous and and you know they weren't laughing all the time so for me if I could make people laugh or if I found the conflict in the room, which I was very sensitive, I'm still sensitive about it. Like I can tell like when people are, when people are about to go at it, can I curse on your show? Yeah, sure, knock yourself out. And I'm like really holding back. I'm trying to be old demure. But I'm, you know, I can, I can literally go in a room right now and, I, and, and see like, okay, what's happening? Like I can read the room. And so as a child, I guess you call that empathic. I could totally read the room. I knew when people are about to, you know, go at it. And I would go like, you know, without the cape, I would literally swoop in and make a joke and lighten the energy. So that is why I think I did so well at stand up so fast, because I came out with a full blown character without <laughs> ever really having to develop it too much. Now, as I'm older and I've had a lot more life experience, I'm integrating, you know, more edgy stuff. I mean, things that are, you know, a little bit more heavy, still with humor, still with humor, because I think the medicine go down, goes down much easier you know, it almost seems like the best of the best comedians are the ones that literally are already in their character, right? They're, they're not making up a character. It's just who they are. And then, and then it just becomes funny. I think those are what they call storytelling comics. Like there are comics that are set up punch, set up punch, set up punch. And they're more, um, what's the word? Observational, right? Yeah. And then you have the storytelling comics. And I remember... I don't know if you're familiar with Mitzi Shore. Mitzi Shore really was the discover. She discovered Jim Carrey and you know Sam Kinison and you know David Brenner. And when she saw me, she saw me. I had really only been on stage. Maybe I'm telling you this. This is the exclusive, Doctor Bitch. Right on. And she does. She didn't even know that. Obviously, <laughs> I had been on stage five times. My picture went up on the wall on the on the hall on the wall of fame. I was just like, who, like, who does that happen to? But because I really did work really hard at honing material unknowingly, but like I knew how to make something funny. And then I would say it in my head. How do I make it funnier? Like, that's a funny character. Let me do, you know. So I was really a full blown character. And she said, Antoinette is a storyteller. <laughs> and I remember hearing her say that she didn't talk very much, but she's right. So my sets, when they used to give me five minutes, I'm like, I'm not going up on stage for five minutes. One story takes five minutes. I'm not doing it. So they used to give me 15. And, and all the other comics were like, you know, how does she get 15 minutes, you know? But Oh, my God. You know, that when, it, when I first learned about you, um, the, the story, again, just from Brooklyn to, to where you come with the success, you know, we do have a, a significant female audience, and, and we're always trying to give a message, right? And... And I loved when we talked before this, that entire journey about taking that big chance, going out on the limb, and then actually finding this success. 
Uh, does it still is it still available today, or is it really political in, in how you become you? Well, that's a really good question. For me, COVID um, presented a big opportunity for me to fast track um, my stand up career into being a host and a facilitator of stories which is why you and I connected so beautifully, especially in the pre-interview. For me, it's about people's stories. And so I feel like in the new era of COVID, a lot of people are home, a lot of people have need, a lot of people need tools because they never had this much time on their own before. They're also having to be creative with their lives in a way that they didn't have to do when they were working for somebody else and they had to show up at a certain time and they go to happy hour and they play, you know, they play ball on the weekend. Like it was a set schedule. So I think now that people are having been forced to change their lives, um, it presents an opportunity for people who are media people to, to, I guess, um, produce more content. And so I do in a way, feel that it's easier if you are creative and if you have something to say, your message can land because you can go straight to your audience. The other side of that is that it's a new demographic, Dr. Mitch. I mean, you know, when I was uh, coming up as a, as a standup and as an actress, there was a time frame for a woman. You know, I remember I, and I didn't have that. It wasn't germane to me to feel, oh, 30 was old because my mother and father, first of all, my mother was beautiful and she had me when she was like 42 years old or 40, I don't even know, but she was a beautiful woman and she aged very beautifully and she's 90, almost 98 today. So wow. I didn't have the same, yeah. And my father was 98 on the day he died and he had never even been in the hospital. So I grew up around older people and I have older siblings. So my point is, is that I didn't, I always knew my success would come later. It was something I knew as a child. So I was always honing and developing, but the demographic has changed. People are living longer and the biggest demographic, a big demographic, I can't really say for sure, but I know that the biggest demographic of consumers are are women 40 plus, right? And so, and we're living longer. And now we have a lot to say. And I think it's really important that we balance out that in the world now, male and female within ourselves, not just bring women up, but bring men up and bring the female in men up. So it's like, we need to balance that inside of ourselves. And I think that's why women have such uh, an important role to play right now. And age is is a plus. I think so too. Wisdom, right? Like um, once you get to a certain age, I mean, it, what does it even mean? Like to me, it does it. I don't even think of age. Here's what it means to me, though. It is that um, incredible wisdom that is is almost not being passed down any longer. What it what we're getting into is what is tomorrow and after tomorrow. Nobody thinks about after tomorrow. That's kind of the new thing generation type stuff we're seeing. Yeah. And man, there is so much wisdom that that is we're trying to pass down through story so that people can either fast forward their life. Um, you know, you telling the story from, uh, you knowing what you want to do as a little girl to where you've gotten in this successful hunt and not even to mention that you got it later in life. Like that is such a powerful statement just right there. And I hope people pick up on is that we are in that. I want it right now generation. And it doesn't happen like that always. It doesn't. And I worked for everything and I know you probably did too. Everything that I achieved, everything that I did. Nobody gave it to me, you know, that was the world that we lived in. But I do think also it's really important to recognize that to solve the problems of today, the answers are not where the problems were created. So in a way, I always look to, I always look to what what the future is and try to get more creative about how to solve the problems in my own life and in what I perceive the problems to be in our society. But I do agree. I think uh, I think young people, like I try with my kids, to always say to them, not to say, "Oh, this is what it was like," but like, I didn't have anybody to help me do my homework. My parents <laughs> didn't tell me what college to go to. Like we said, it's like if you wanted to find out who somebody was, you had to go to the library, get on a, two buses, 
go to the library, go find the book, then make a mimeograph copy of it. And you know, it's just like everything was, everything was not readily available. However, I do think that the reason the world has changed so dramatically and so quickly over the last 30 years, I mean, I think about 30 years, I have, I, we, I had a cell phone, I think in the first big cell phone that looked like a shoe. Uh, <laughs> I think it was like 98. I don't even know. It's like not that long ago. Yeah. And so I just, I, I try to let my kids understand that they're living in a world that really didn't exist 30, 35, 40 years ago. And I always say to people our age or in our age range, that it's really important for us to be storytellers because like we're the bridge between the old world and the new world. And our story, I think is really, really an important story to tell. I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm ever the hopeful person, but I do <laughs> you think, are. I am, I am, I am. I, I do think that it's, I, I do think that it, it, it presents an opportunity for us all. It's scary. It's scary as fuck. Yeah. And I really <laughs> wake up in the morning and I'm like, holy shit. Like, did this really happen? I'm like, are we? St- I remember sitting on my 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 easy chair, March sixteenth, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> masks, um, where I got to stay in. Never in a million years thinking that it would be, you know, nine or ten months later. And to be honest with you, I even said back then, I said, you know, if this thing goes over three months that's not good. I was scared of that because I don't think any of us should be comfortable with this. It's so, it's so true. And, and, you know, we, we've been, we've had other podcasts that we've talked about the exact same thing. And we just run a NHL uh, hockey guy and, and, you know, no fans in the stands. It's, it's just kind of weird time. And, you know, it almost, it almost accentuates though, what people like yourself do. Um, there is nothing like seeing that person in in person and laughing while you're in there with a drink in your hand, uh, laughing more probably with three drinks in your hand. But it's it's that personal communication, and that's what makes me freaked out. Completely stopped the ability to be a live performer. I mean, and think about it. That's also the case for you know for musicians and people who perform. Yeah. I mean, they're. And then, of course, the service staff that services all of that. So it's been, it's devastating. And it's silenced a lot of voices because what a lot of, a lot of comics don't really know what to do if they're not in front of an audience. For me, I, I had already had a talk show uh, a long time ago that I had had. Um, so I kind of was comfortable in this uh, medium. And so for me, when my show got canceled, my live show, which was kind of a big deal, it was like, it was like my first big tour and it was going to be on April 23rd and then it just got canceled. So I decided to turn it into a conversation to keep, uh, keep us all talking and keep people seeing comics. It's very difficult to do comedy. I tried it and I'll never do it again to do, you know, to do comedy on Zoom. I did it from my bathroom and I'm like, okay, this is weird. Okay, I'm in my bathroom. I don't know. And I don't even know if people are laughing or not. And it's just like, I was talking to Sinbad about it too. He's like, that's like crazy. He's like, I, I, you can ha- take like the best comic in the world and they will look like they've never done comedy before. So for stand up comics, it's a really tough thing. And stand up comics are a very important voice. And so, in a way, I'm not saying it's being silenced on purpose, but it is being silenced. Don't you think the, the idea of comedy though is, Comedies like psychiatry with sociology with a hardcore truth that can be spoken in an otherwise platform sometimes that other people are scared to say stuff. Totally. Totally. I mean, totally. That's powerful. Think flipping in the rhymes. You're slipping in the idea. And I don't think people, I don't even think comics do it intentionally. I don't think comics go, hey, you know, I'm going to put in this social... It's how they feel with a, with a comedy bent. And so people will hear it. It's all done as entertainment. Very powerful. It is. Laughter is so powerful. And that's, that's what I think is the big crusher right now is, is you're, I think we are all learning that the kind of the liberal arts and stuff, how important that stuff is from music to, to comedy to everything. And I think that is the big tragedy of, of all of this, we are losing that human touch. 
Well, Dr. Mitch, you're doing a great job because you know, you're providing content, you're providing an opportunity and a platform for these kinds of conversations. For me, you know, I'm doing the same. I have comics on and I have all kinds of people on. And I think it's important for us to be able to share those ideas. I think it's important for people to hear the ideas. I think it's important for people to be able to connect and ask questions. And, you know, I, and I also think it's a great opportunity for comedians and performers to find another way to reach their audiences. And they have audiences and their audiences need the content. So, and here's the thing, I started my show and next thing you know, I've got people watching me in Finland. Now as a comic, as an, even an, as an actress, people may have seen my ER episode, they may have seen stuff, but this is much more impact because I'm able to go directly into people's homes now and that's a responsibility I take very seriously, but it's also a huge opportunity. And so I think, and I hope that this that's happening to us all is an important moment in history. And I think we will look back and they will look back in the lines of time back to this point and say, wow, that really did happen. It's like the Renaissance, you know, yeah. but I think for us, it's happening very quickly and it's global. It is. I, I I can't wait to get back to real human touch. I that I, maybe I'm old school. I don't know, but I want to be sitting in that club, sitting there listening and laughing and, and having too. that good old time. I, I just think there's nothing better. I think so too. I mean, obviously, we'll get back there. We'll get back there. It's just taking a little bit of time. Tell me though, because I've got you on here and, and just your success that you've done. You know, you, you often hear this, or I will hear this. It it doesn't happen like that anymore. Tell me, tell me what we probably already know. It's hard work. It's perseverance. When you decided you do that and you went and did it, can it still happen today for young people? It's a real. It's a really good question, and I wish I really knew the answer to that. You know, when I was coming up, you know, there was there was a system on how to do it, right? And you could study acting and then you could do a show and then they would invite industry people to the show. And if you were really good, you would stand out, you know, and then that could lead. And so there was a, a way to do it, right? Yeah. You know, there isn't that way anymore. And then even bef way before COVID, I mean, the reality TV uh, changed how, you know, how things get done, how people get paid and actually it was filling the airwaves. So, there was a lot less opportunity for real actors who really honed a craft. So it's a very different thing now. And I, I have a lot of young people who want to pursue it. And I, I wouldn't even know the first thing to tell them on how to do that. I could say that the only way that I would do it is to do um, stuff on the internet and create content that way. Um, but then it has to be produced. And so I don't know, Dr. Mitch, I, I wouldn't even know I wouldn't know. I mean, I have friends, obviously, but they have, had already been working before COVID, right? So they already have careers, but even they have had to shape shift. They've had to change the way they do things. And it's sort of like, I felt like also for celebrities, it's been a hard thing, right? Because oh, sure, it's leveled the playing field in a way because everybody is home. So it's like, you're not able to kind of do what you do. And now you're kind of like everybody else. And so that has got probably really hard. And then people who have these huge lives financially to support, I mean, it's just, it's just, if you really think about it, it's just a changed world. But to, but to answer your question, I think, first of all, working hard, I don't even like to say working hard because it, it says like, it's almost like you have to work. When, when you find your passion, and I, and I guess this is really for me the most important thing that I could say today, Everyone comes into their lives with something that they're passionate about. And usually that's the focus of what they want to do in this life. And so I always encourage my own children and young people, I have a huge young following, 18 to 24. And that's mostly my demographic of my followers and my, my audience, which is amazing. And it's, it's very humbling that you find what it is that makes your heart sing. And it sounds wooey wooey, but it's not. When you find that, that's your contribution. And usually, usually I would say almost always, the universe rises to help you. 
And I really believe that when you figure out what you love to do, and some people will say, well, I don't really know what I want to do. And I'm like, that's cool. That's cool. You don't have to know. You're 15 years old. How could you possibly know? <laughs> right. but, but move in the direction of your passion. Do the things that make you happy because always that brings abundance. You'll find a way to make money from that. But that is, it's the truest of all stories. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I've been transitioning from a career that is just, has done a lot of things for me financially, personally, and all that. And, um, but there was always something burning inside that there's more, right? And uh, it was always about sharing stories. I love sharing stories with people um, because I, I truly think that's a, the way we learn. And that's, that's my passion is to share the stories of people who, just like yourself, who've already been successful, you've done it. I mean, the po most powerful statement I think we've, we've talked about today, at least for me, what I took from it is, you know, you, you were patient and you waited till your time was there, and, and, uh, but still followed the dream and, and catch it, right? So I, that, this is what I do. This is, this is what I love to do, and um, it's, it's just it's something that, like you said, it's that passion, right? And, and I saw it in you, too, because when I got introduced to you, I was like, oh, yes, I'm bringing her on. A, because Italians are always entertaining, right? I mean, even if they're not, <laughs> even if they're not talking about anything. What do I amuse you? <laughs> you do amuse me. You absolutely. Am I <laughs> absolutely. That's a comedian, man. That's what you're supposed to do. You were born to do it. And then just your story, the perseverance, the, the going after a dream. I mean, God, if we don't tell these stories, you know, what, what is this next generation going to look for? I mean, there's, there's just got to be a hero in the story. And so I appreciate you. Appreciate that, Mitch. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm just saying I appreciate you so much for coming on and sharing, just sharing that story and kind of what's going on in the world and your industry and, and just your positive message. And, and it's just, it's good. It's just good. Thank you. I, I appreciate I appreciate you asking me to come on. And, and, and it's nice to I don't often revisit my own life. But I um, I've always known that I wanted to lift people up. You know, that's that's always uh, always been important to me to lift lift those around me up as much as I can. But you can't do that unless you feel good about who you are. And when you're following your passion, and I just knew it from an early age, I just was a born entertainer. Not that I was like always on, but I, I was a sharer. I like to communicate. I'd like to always like listen to what people, how they react to things. And I always like to observe things and observe people. So for me, you know, it's been a really, um, it's never been a question. It, isn't it funny? You can make as much money as, you know, makes you as comfortable as whatever. But when you do have that passion, it's like, I'm not satisfied until I'm doing what I want to do. And it, it's crazy, right? Isn't that a crazy feeling? Totally crazy. And I will say that's absolutely exactly what happened. I had given up my, not given it up, but I was just like, I had two kids. I was like running around getting changed for auditions. Um, I, was, I was always like being cast as the crack whore. You know, I was like, I, and I'm running from a commercial audition. I'm changing in the car. I'm like, I got two babies at home. And I'm like, oh my God. Like I just, whatever. But I had this side business that just grew into this monster business. And then I, then I started another company, right? But then right. even as successful as it was, and I had like huge A-list people that I was doing events for. And I was just like, you know what? Really, it's gonna like you're getting to this age, really? Like, you have an X amount of time left. Like, just just because you're good at shit doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. And I'm good at a lot of different things, is what I found out. But here's my point: the moment I, at the moment I closed the business, the entertainment business got me right back. I went right back on stage. And I picked up my stand-up career higher than when I left it first yep. time back, you know? Man, is that a true story? It was the same thing with me. You know, it was one of those, it was one of those moments where, you know, we're living this great life and, and uh, I'm stepping into this arena that I know is going to change our life. And it wasn't just me. It's my wife, my kids, everything. But when you're drawn to do it, can't fight it. Magnificent forces will come to your aid. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for coming on our show. God, it, it, and, and we're going to stay in touch, I hope. Uh, I hope. It's, 
it's possible I like you more than you like me, but uh, <laughs> we, so. Like to come on my show, Dr. Mitch. Oh, I would love to do it. Because you know what? You're a chiropractor and I have a lot. I have, I'm very, very interested in chiropractors because I think that is a very specific type of doctor. It's, and I think that's probably why you are able to transition into other things because chiropractors are putting their hands on and it's stories. Because when you hear the story, the body is the reflection of the story sometimes, right? And so bet. I'm very interested in that story as well. So I had a chiropractor on. Uh, already on one of my episodes that I do, uh, Transformational Thursday. So uh, I hope that you'll come on my show. Tell, tell us how we can get a hold of you. How can people see what you're doing, where you're at, all oh, your touring, all that? Thank you, my love. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, you can find me on social media, my first and last name. Uh, so I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I have a website where you can see some of my stand-up clips. That's www.antoinetteperagine, with a hard G, dot com. <laughs> yeah. um, I make appearances all over the place. So uh, if you go to my social media, that's probably the easiest way to follow what I do. Antoinette and Friends is also uh, my show page. I post everything there and you can see clips from, I interviewed um, my, one of my, uh, George Lopez came on and Sinbad and I've got somebody, uh, I have uh, a great actor coming on who just won an Emmy and stuff. So anyway, that's a very long winded answer. Antoinette Perry Jean, just go to my social media. Wonderful. And we want, we also, we want to shout out to Lauren. I mean, just, uh, just the greatest, you guys have been the easiest and the greatest people to work with. Um, Thank you. Just can't even tell you how much fun this has been. Let's stay in touch. We always are going to do more work together at some point in time. We'll share everything we have with you. So if you guys need anything from us, you let us know. We'll do everything we can to, to do what we can. Same back at you. Thank you, Chad. You have an amazing organization. Very professional. This has been Lovely. And thank you oh. to Lauren Farrafan, my producer. She is the best. Chad's been doting on her ever since uh, we, we started doing this thing. So, uh, again, thank you both so much, and let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Have a great thank day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, guys.